Well, the last time I did this, two years ago, when I had first come to Bible, we were in the middle of a sermon series on the seven deadly sins, and I had the uh, unfortunate or good fortune, whichever you want to think of it, to have to do a sermon on lust and envy. So um, I figure everything is downhill from that. <laughs> So today we will talk a little bit about the way of women, but not just the way of women only, the way of discipleship, the way for women and men. When I was in my spiritual direction training, not surprisingly, we talked about the spiritual journey. It's important to know that it is, in fact, a journey. Certainly with our Wesleyan heritage, we are familiar with that concept of moving toward perfection. We are people always on the way. The goal of the spiritual journey is transformation. As we move, we are changed. If my concept of God is still the same as the one I had when I was five years old, then I haven't been moving. I haven't been growing. So I'm not on the way. When I learned about the spirit, what I learned about the spiritual journey was that the way of transformation has been different for men and women traditionally across most times and cultures. In the Western culture, we are the first to kind of deviate a little bit from this. While both sexes ex experience both ascent and descent, for men, the journey begins with ascent, with that rising up. It is tempered, though, by some sort of an initiation rite in other cultures that teaches young men what to do with their pain and how to handle their power. Because if we do not know how to transform our pain, we end up transmitting it to others. And if you don't know how, to, how you fit into the larger picture of the world, you will abuse your power. For women, however, the traditional journey began with descent. Women have those physical reminders that we are not in control of our pregnancy, childbirth, and those cycles that, that make that possible are those bodily reminders that we don't have control over everything. I have a pregnant friend who recently commented that she was very surprised at how much she realized that she was no longer in control. The way of spiritual growth is always a downward path. Descent is necessary to spiritual growth because all great spirituality is about letting go, about learning not to be in control. And relinquishing control does not come easy for most of us, which is why Jesus' words in our text for today are so challenging. So here are these words from the eighth chapter of Mark. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Imagine you were in a buffet line at a civic club meeting. There is one dessert left, and you and your friend are the last people in line, and no more dessert is coming out. You say to your friend, go ahead, you take the dessert. And then your friend says, no, no, you take it. This exchange goes on back and forth for a few minutes, but with each change of, of, of exchange, you go get more intractable in your position. Finally, your friend, at your insistence, takes that contested dessert. This is not what Jesus meant by denying yourself. Because what has just happened is that you have procured the right to win the next dessert at a future meeting where this same scenario plays itself out. Far from an act of self-denial, you have basically entered into a contract whether you know it or not, or acknowledge it or not. You may have given up the dessert, but now you have control over your friend. You have the power to win at the next contest. This is not how Jesus practiced self-denial. Jesus' way is a way of downward mobility. It is a way of descent, of relinquishing control. It's why Jesus said what he said about suffering and rejection. Peter was reacting from the perspective of ascent. We can likely relate to Peter. We don't passively accept rejection. We want to be in control, and being rejected takes away our power. Jesus makes it clear that following him involves loss of life, loss of control, a way of downward mobility. Most of us are not called to a heroic giving of one's life. Rather, what we are called to is a daily dying to self. At every moment, we are given choices, and the choice we make can be either a choice to die to self and live for God, or to live for ourselves, preserving that sense of being in control, which is living in such a way as to avoid that downward path. Our egos cling to control like a dying person to a life preserver. Self-denial is a denial of self-will, and our self-will is driven by ego. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this about self-denial. Self-denial can never be defined as some profusion, be it ever so great, of individual acts of self-torment or asceticism. It is not suicide, since there, too, a person's self-will can yet assert itself. Self-denial means knowing only Christ and no longer oneself. It means seeing only Christ who goes ahead of us and no longer the path that is too difficult for us. Like any path we travel, we take one step at a time. Our spiritual journey is not a drag race. It is more of a slow, plodding, winding way. We move forward by daily dying to self, by daily choices to see only Christ in every moment, every step. Whenever we are faced with the choice between self-will and self-denial, Dying to self means choosing to follow the way of Christ. Think about the whole of Jesus' ministry. Long before the events that led to his crucifixion, Jesus practiced time and time again, losing his life in smaller ways. He made choices that put him at odds with those in power in his day. He healed people on the Sabbath. He touched those with leprosy. He ate with sinners. Choosing to defy the norms and structures of power for the sake of the kingdom of God was a putting to death of self-will. 
And that self-will seeks self-preservation. Because he endured through to the crucifixion, we see that he put to death that self-will. It takes practice to die. Practice that happens in the nitty-gritty of everyday life and all of those countless small choices that we have between trusting earthly power and trusting God. Each of those small choices is a choice to either save our life or, or lose our life. Taking up the cross as we, is not, as we often use the term, choosing to bear with some discomfort, like your air conditioning being out, or dealing with an annoying person. Taking up the cross is choosing faithful discipleship to Jesus, which includes bearing the burdens of our brothers and sisters. How do we faithfully practice losing our lives for the sake of the gospel? What are ways in which we can choose in the mundane moments of everyday life to die to self? How can we take up the cross and follow Jesus? When Jesus washed the feet of his disciples at the Passover meal, he gave us an example of dying to self. The great hymn of Jesus in Philippians 2 uses words like emptied himself and humbled himself. The act of washing the feet of his disciples illustrated the kind of life that these disciples should lead. To wash a guest's feet was the duty of the person of lowest rank in the household, maybe even a slave. Jesus was willing to take that rank, to die to the prestige he possessed as the Son of God. It was an act of putting others before himself. I wonder if he was inspired to wash the disciples' feet by the woman who came to him at yet another dinner and washed his feet with perfume. She emptied herself at the feet of Jesus. She humbled herself, incurring the criticism and the displeasure of the other guests at the meal. She saw only Jesus looking through the eyes of love, choosing the way of the cross, giving herself for another. It's doubtful that you've ever heard of Marina. She is a fifth century woman. When her father Eugenios announced his intention to give all of his wealth to her and go and become a monk, she refused to be left behind and insisted on following her father. They decided that Marina would shave her head wear men's clothing, and change her name to the more masculine Marinos in order to enter the same monastery as her father. This was at a time when there were not many monasteries, if any, for women. Eugenios gave all their wealth away, and they went to join the monastic community. Marina was an exemplary monk. She was known for her obedience, her humility, and her devotion to prayer. No one ever suspected that she was a woman. One day, years after her father died, the abbot sent Marina off with some other monks to transact some business for the monastery. They spent the night at an inn that was frequently used by the traveling monks. While they were there, another guest at the inn, a soldier, seduced the innkeeper's daughter and suggested that if she became pregnant, she should accuse Marina. She did become pregnant and the accusation was made, but Marina accepted the accusation and begged for forgiveness. The abbot of the monastery expelled Marina, but she took up residence right outside the gates of the monastery. When the baby boy was brought to Marina, she accepted him without protest and cared for him. The two lived outside the monastery gate for four years. Marina continually requested readmission and confessed her sin to all who passed by. 
Deeply moved by her contrition, the community eventually granted her readmittance along with the child. She accepted the lowest rank in the community. It was not until her death that the community learned the truth of who she was. Marina bore the unjust accusation all her days. The devotion she had learned in the monastery, the daily dying to self that monastic obedience cultivated, bore fruit in the quiet acceptance of a punishment that was really not hers to bear. She gave us an example of what it means to lose one's life for the sake of Christ. Catherine Doherty was born in Russia into a family of nobility. In the Russian Revolution, she became a refugee in Finland, almost starving to death. Eventually, she and her first husband, who was also nobility, he was a baron, they immigrated to Canada and lived a life of material comfort. Catherine was dissatisfied, though, with such a life and began to feel the promptings of a deeper call through a passage that leaped to her eyes every time she opened the Bible. Arise, go, sell all you possess, take up your cross and follow me. Eventually, she gave up her life of comfort to serve the poor. Her program of action was simple. She lived among the poor with an open door and an open heart. She did not need to seek out people in need. They just came to her. She lived according to a set of principles, principles that she said she received from God and that she called her little mandate. Here is what guided her life. Arise, go, sell all you possess. Give it directly, personally to the poor. Take up my cross, their cross, and follow me. Going to the poor, being poor, being one with them, one with me. Little, be always little. Be simple, poor, childlike. Preach the gospel with your life without compromise. Listen to the Spirit. He will lead you. Do little things exceedingly well for love of me. Love, 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 never counting the cost. Go into the marketplace and stay with me. Pray fast. Pray always fast. Be hidden. Be a light to your neighbor's feet. Go without fear into the depth of men's hearts. I shall be with you. Pray always. I will be your rest. Catherine spoke often of the duty of the moment. She described it this way. The duty of the moment is what you should be doing at any given time in whatever place God has put you. You may not have Christ and a homeless person at your door, but you may have a little child. If you have a child, your duty of the moment may be to change a dirty diaper. So you do it. But you don't just change the diaper. You change it to the best of your ability with great love for both God and that child. Catherine saw only Christ, took up her cross, bearing the burdens of her brothers and sisters, and she knew how to die to self moment by moment. A friend of mine who owns a restaurant and a catering business took in an elderly aunt several years ago to live with her. The aunt had often had to choose between household expenses and medicine, not having sufficient resources for both. My friend earns significant revenue from caterings and medical offices, caterings that were paid for by pharmaceutical companies. Struck with the contrast between the sums spent on catering by these companies and the hardship that drug costs created for folks like her aunt, 
She chose to forego catering gigs for pharmaceutical companies as a way to make a statement about the predicament that many experience in trying to pay for medicines and the other costs of living. She chose a way that might not make sense to some of us, especially according to human standards. This was a number of years ago, and I remember how convicted I was by her action. And I wondered how I might practice being so faithful and dying to self. And especially was convicted because this friend of mine is not a churchgoer. Yet I continue to see ways all through the years that she practices this dying to self, showing compassion to others, many of whom are in difficult circumstances, and she does it without drawing attention to herself. How are we called to these daily deaths? Maybe one reason, one way, is by looking at, at what's going on just all around us, because we are so largely detached from the sources of what we consume, whether it's food, clothing, or technology, our daily deaths may focus on making the lifestyle changes for the sake of the gospel. This detachment from the sources of goods we consume may mean that we support injustice and oppression without even being aware of it. Whether it's clothing produced in sweatshops, cacao and chocolate dependent on that cacao harvested by child labor, electronics made with conflict minerals, or produce harvested by migrant workers who are afforded no protection from the pesticides that the crop dusters spray over them. We wield power through our purchases. We have the power to contribute to life, to bear the cross for our brothers and sisters who have little power. The dollar you hold in your hand can be an instrument of oppression or the means for life for another. Do we see only Christ in our purchasing choices? United Methodist women are committed to missions. Some of these initiatives that I've just mentioned are things that they address. Through education, we can then be made aware of these places where oppression and injustice exist. And then through advocacy, we die to self to bring life to others. UMW and their work can give us focus and direction so that we can follow Christ into the world, making choices that put faith, hope, and love in action. Maybe what we are called to in this moment is to change a diaper. Maybe it is to forego a purchase that perpetuates the oppression of another. Maybe it is to bear an unjust criticism rather than retaliate against another. Each of us will have different ways to embody this dying to self. And because it means choosing self-denial over self-will, the choices we make aren't necessarily easy. But that doesn't mean that we simply shrug our shoulders and ignore the call to follow Christ. Faithfulness is not measured by how noticeable the impact of our actions, but by the transformation of our hearts. Each time we choose the way of Jesus, we increase our ability to maintain focus on divine things rather than human things. Each time we deny ourselves and practice the small deaths, we choose this way of downward mobility the path of spiritual growth.